we won't have to rearrange, but in the meantime, we're going to have fun with it. So, uh, yeah, so there's that. I'll give everybody just another minute. I don't think we're going to be able to complete our, our prophetic and healing time in an hour, so. Um, that's the first slide. I need Andrew. Where's she at? i got to find my slides. All right, here we go. Is there another team still going back there? Yes. Okay. All right, we're going to get started. The prophetic. This is training number three, week three, I believe. So we're on week three. So how many of y'all know what Logos and Rhema is? Good, most of you. So we're going to break this down just a little bit because to understand the prophetic, you're going to have to understand these two words. Um, the word that's in our English Bible, the word word in our English Bible generally is translated from two Greek words with slightly different meanings. So if you know anything about language, a word for word translation is very, very difficult. When we're in Haitian Creole, I'll say something in English and I know enough Creole to go, that wasn't my intent. Because it has to be interpreted and then released in that culture. So Many times when we have something in the Greek or the Hebrew, there are words that we just don't have an exact word to carry that intent. So when we're reading in the New Testament and we read the word word, it's translated and it comes from one of two words. And there's just some distinct differences in the meanings of these words. So, of course, I'm building on the previous two weeks, so I'm not going to go back and review but the common definitions for logos, which is one way that word is translated, it's the root word, is simply means our Bible or scriptures or the Lord God Himself. So some of the uses in John 1.1, 1, 1, this is the New American Standard Version, which is most of the scriptures I'll be using tonight. But in the beginning was the word, logos, and the word was with God and the word was God. So that's one of the places this word is used. Um, John 1.14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory. The logos became flesh. That's why we can say that it is the Lord himself is one way that word is translated. And then Revelation 19.13, He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. So there's three uses for logos. And I want you to understand the, the finality of the logos. Here's some of the words that just help us to describe that. It is forever settled. It is unchanging. It is creative. It's self-fulfilling. It is powerful. It's true. It's without error. It's infallible. It is complete and life-giving. And this is really important, this little statement right here. Any seeming failure or inconsistency is due to our failure in understanding, believing, responding, or obeying. Okay? So if we say the Scripture, any failure in our under, any appearance of a failure in Scripture is not a failure in Scripture, it's a failure of our understanding or application of that. So that's the Logos. It's the forever settled Word of God, both as Jesus in truth and in the Word, the Scripture. It's God's eternal standard. It's consistent, absolute standard by which all other expressions, concepts, revelations, doctrine, preaching, or prophecies are measured. I'm just wanting to get across and kind of hammer in one powerful truth. If you are going to minister prophetically, that prophetic ministry must be judged by the Logos, the forever settled Word of God. It's the unchanging, consistent measurement. But, don't hear what I'm saying wrong. You can read the Scripture, and a lost man can read the Scripture and interpret 
in Scripture. So that's why there is a second word called the rhema. We could call that the, the living, flowing word. And we're going to break that down just a little bit. We could say it is a word from the word. A word from the word. And this is really, really important to grasp the distinction. You see, when we just read in the New Testament, we think word means word. But it doesn't. There's two foundational words for that. So a rhema, which is a Greek word that our English Bible translates word, is a word from the word. Give you a little Vines Expository Dictionary of the New Testament. This is how this defines it. Rhema denotes that which is spoken, which is uttered in speech and writing in a singular a word. The significance of rhema as distinct from logos is exemplified in the injunction to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word, the rhema of God. You see, when we read that in Ephesians 6, it's not saying pick up the Scripture as a sword. It's not even saying, and I'm not saying this is a wrong application, but it's not a rhema application. When you are praying and you draw from your mind the Scripture and quote it, that's still not a rhema word because it's drawn from your mind. But if the Holy Spirit enlightens the Word that you've put inside of you and you pray it out, where the Spirit has ignited it or illuminated it, it's now become a rhema word. There's a distinct difference. When God breathes on that Scripture and you speak it out, is a rhema. When you simply remember it and speak it out, you're declaring, which is powerful, but you're declaring the Logos. There's two distinctions there that we must understand. Romans, 7, or Romans 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word or rhema of Christ. I want you to hear that. Sometimes we've thought if we just play the word and we hear it, that's good. That's good foundational building because we're absorbing the word of God in us. But faith doesn't come by simply absorbing the Word of God. Now I know this may sound contrary, but that's not what this Scripture is saying. Just by listening to it is, doesn't make it a rhema. But the moment you, you've all been reading your Bible, you're sitting there and you're reading and you're reading the same thing you've read maybe 30 times before, and it seems to just come alive, come off the page, jump into your heart, and you've got a new level of faith. It's the same thing that you've read, but the Holy Spirit just illuminated it. He just made it revelatory to you right now in that moment. That's what a rhema is. Prophetic, when you were ministered to prophetically, if it was sourced in God, then it is a rhema word. Now, just to be real, sometimes as people are growing in the prophetic, It'll come from source from themselves off of a scripture they've remembered. While that may be good, that's not a prophetic rhema word. There is a difference. The difference is how is it sourced and brought forth. That's the difference in logos and rhema. So a rhema is a, a, a timely word. Holy Spirit inspired word. From the Logos that brings life, power, faith to perform and fulfill it. It carries with it faith. When you have a rhema word come to you. That's why it says faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the rhema word. Rhema carries with it the ability to ignite faith in the ones that hears it. Now, it does not ignite obedience. There is a distinct difference there. It may ignite faith, but faith has to turn into obedience. Yeah. And we're going to begin looking at that. Um, well, I'm not going to get ahead of myself here. Perceived failures of rhema or logos prophecies. You notice I said perceived failures. 
Neither of those actually fail, but those receiving them possibly have misapplied it, misunderstood it, misinterpreted it, didn't respond to it, or simply walked away from it. So what do you do when you receive a prophetic word and you go, it just never came to pass? Well, there's two things. The person missed it, therefore it never was a, a rhema word. Or, you failed to step into it for some reason or another. We're going to look at that. So the people receiving the word may fail to believe it, to understand it, to interpret it, to respond to it, or act accordingly. I want to give you, I'm just going to touch on this, but we're going to dig into it a little bit later. In Exodus 6, 5-8, through 8, there's a scripture. We're going to, I'll put it up on the screen a little bit later. This prophecy failed for everyone that received it except Joshua and Caleb. So here you have Moses declaring a prophetic word. We all agree he is a prophet. To somewhere around 600,000 men. And only two of them entered into that. So that means that word failed for 598,000 some odd people. Was he a false prophet? Hebrews 3.19 says they, those that he spoke to, could not enter in because of unbelief. Mm -hmm. There is a responsibility of belief that we can never walk away from. So that is why it's so important for you and your spiritual oversight to judge the word that you receive. So many people will shy away from judging a word because when you judge it, you carry a greater level of personal responsibility for it. It's real easy to say, I'm just putting it on the shelf. Well, nowhere in Scripture are we told to put it on the shelf. We're told to judge the word. But in judging it, there carries a high level of responsibility. Now, there are things that I have judged, but I've come back to many times. Because sometimes you're in chapter 2 of your book, and your prophecy is in chapter 8 of your book, and you don't have the faith yet to enter into it. Now, maybe when you got it, you were stirred but you've not got the faith to step into the obedience of walking it out. So there are times when I feel like I want to believe, but Lord, I just don't have the faith to step into it. But as I continually revisit the prophetic words over my life, which I've done just about every quarter for many, 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 many years, I've still got an old cassette player, and I pop them in and I listen to them, because I like to listen to them because I carry some of the emotion. Because emotion can be a very vital part of the delivery of a prophetic word at higher levels. So I like to listen to those words. And if I don't have the recording, I've got them written out. But I visit them every quarter. And I have. Because sometimes what I listen to at one point, I'm like, well, I don't get it. But then five years later, it's like, I get it because it's my life now. Because it was in chapter 8 and I was having faith in chapter 2. So an important note to consider. So let me go back. Perceived failures. Neither actually fail, but those receiving the logos of the rainbow may fail. That brings us to that scripture. They couldn't enter in because of unbelief. So Deuteronomy 18.22 when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, the prophet has spoken presumptuously. Now many times, people that want the prophetic to not be real will point to something like that. And they'll say, it didn't come to pass, so therefore the prophet was wrong, or the prophetic minister was wrong. So I'm using... They're not the same, but I'm kind of using interchangeably at this moment for a point. I say, well, it didn't come to pass, therefore, it wasn't the Lord. 
Well, that's not necessarily the case, and it wasn't for those 598, 99,000 people that did not enter into the promised land. It says they didn't enter in because of unbelief, not because the prophet was wrong or the prophecy was wrong. So when we, when we are judging something, if we are about to say it's not of the Lord, we need to have in consideration the one that received the prophecy as well as the one that delivered it. You cannot separate those two completely. Now once you judge that word, then there's the separation, there's a distinction. So, summarize Logos and Raymond. We say the Logos for meaning the Scripture as a whole, the Word, the Bible, or the Word made flesh, Jesus Himself. Rhema. It may have different forms such as Scripture quickened by the Spirit, God personally speaking to an individual, or a personal prophecy or so on. But I want to make sure that you can distinguish those two. Y'all with me? Yes. So... I'm not sharing a lot of stories. I'm trying to get you to, to content here. And I'll, I'll share some stories later. Summarize and continuing. A rhema given by a prophetic minister may be in agreement with the word, but the minister himself or herself may not be. I want you to hear that. This is really, really important. The word delivered may be in agreement with the word, with the Logos, the Word of God, but the one who delivered it, the channel in which it flowed through, may not be in agreement. You have to be able to distinguish those. And here's an example. The Logos says that wisdom from above is first gentle. It goes on. A prophetic minister may give a rhema word which is in agreement with the Logos, but his presentation may be harsh, brash, rude, or unkind. That delivery is not in agreement with the spirit of the word. It's really important to know that. I have heard people get up and minister the truth, but minister it out of such bitterness that it, it, was, it was horrible. And that type of spirit many times will come in and begin to corporately control a group. Yes. And then the next stage of that is, this is truth. Well, it is truth, but it's completely out of spirit. So you have to be able to distinguish both of those. I've done it. I've done it. I've shared some of those stories last couple of weeks with you and how I've ministered things. And I ministered out, out of such a driven personality. And I actually thought that was a gift from God. And it was not until I realized it was demonic. Because it stole every bit of peace that I ever had. So you can get up in front of people. I'll, I'll, I'll just give you an example. I've been training church planters. And would stand in front of them. And with no consideration of their calling. Convince them that they needed to plant a church. You see, I took a, what we could say, I have no problem with denominations, I have a problem with denominationalism. That's the spirit that begins to take over, not the denominations itself. So when that spirit begins to take over, it makes cookie cutter clones out of people with no value for their distinctiveness, no value for their uniqueness or their gifting. So, myself unaware, I would be in front of a room of people that came to a Bible training and I would convince them to go plant a church without any personal relationship or consideration where they called to do that. That came out of a driven personality that at one time I thought was a gift from God. And then I realized I was driving people into the ground. So while I'm happy that we saw all of these churches planted, I know there was a great cost to individuals in doing so. That's what I'm talking about. The logos may be in alignment, but the spirit out. Y'all with me? 
So let's just look at a couple of things here, comparing Logos and Rhema. Logos would say is the Word of God, Rhema, a word from the Word. Logos, general prophecies, Rhema, personal prophecies. When I say general, I'm not saying not specific. That's not the general I'm talking about, but in application. Um, Logos, is there's unconditional prophecies. Rhema, and I'm going to say this, is always conditional upon our response to it. A logos is instructions for all people. A rhema is an instruction for one person or a specific group. The logos is unchanging and unfailing. A rhema can fail or its application and it can be changed. I'll show you some scripture on that later. Logos is a revelation of God. A rhema is God revealing and relating. For those of you that were received ministry tonight, I hope, and that was part of our goal, in being sensitive to not just hear truth, but to present it as God would in a relatable format. You know, sometimes you can you can deliver a prophetic word and literally drive it down someone's throat. But the prophetic is always invitational into a deeper place in God. So that's part of a culture that, that I desire for us to walk in is always releasing it into an invitational type format that's very encouraging and literally feel like they were kissed by God. That's the goal. One is the wisdom of God. Another is a word of wisdom. One is the knowledge of God. A rhema is a word of knowledge. One is God's thoughts written. One is God, a rhema is one thought personalized. I'm just trying to draw you some distinctions here. So remember, when you're reading through your New Testament in English, and it says word, it's going to be one or the other. And there is a distinct difference in the two. So I encourage you to dig that out when you're reading your Bible. What is he actually saying here? Because if you're thinking one way, and it's in this column, and you're thinking this column, you can really go a bad way. Or if you're thinking it's over here, and it's a rhema for you specifically. You see, that's what I was doing in those church planting schools. I had a rhema to equip church planters. But my application was making it corporate for everybody that was in front of me. That was going to skew. That can cause damage. It still looks beautiful. It still appears that it's buried great fruit. Because we say we planted all of these churches. But leave out the story to where this person went and planted the church and it just destroyed their life, destroyed their family because they didn't have a call or a gift or a rhema for them to do it. They were walking on my rhema. So that's why we have to be very, very sensitive and not project our rhema onto someone else. Don't make our rhema, which is relating and personal to us, someone else's. So we always want to honor someone's uniqueness and diversity. Sometimes you, in, in the prophetic, you will be in such a flow with God in a personal way that you will try to release what is happening in you onto someone else because you're not distinguishing well. So we always want to be aware of that. Now, God is aware of what we're going through. He's not surprised that you are at this place in life and that you are receiving such awesome stuff that He is able to put in front of you someone that's needing that, what you're walking through. But you have to be able to distinguish, am I hearing from the Lord or am I just releasing my passion? So when you're in that place, draw a distinction. Don't be afraid to say, you know, I feel like this is a real word for the Lord for you, but I just want to add my thoughts to it. And draw a distinction. There's nothing wrong with your thoughts, especially when they're in line with the, the logos. But don't present them to someone as a rhema. 
Okay, God can use where you're at, but draw the distinction. And as we, we continue on, I also want to draw a distinction. Of sometimes someone will be flowing in the prophetic, but they'll release it through prayer. I need to know if you're prophesying to me or you're praying for me. Don't leave me in a place of wonder and awe. You know, draw a distinction. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to prophesy to you. Now, if you're in a place that doesn't embrace the prophetic, go ahead and pray it out. But if you're in a place that, that's got it, hey, I want to share this word with you. I want to submit this word to you for you to judge. Don't pray it out. Release it as a prophetic word. And I think that's part of maturing. Now, we will go into prayer at times, and we will pray, you know, rhema words out. That's fine if you're not prophesying, but if you're intent on prophesying, don't disguise it in prayer. It's just part of growing. So let's dig into uh, the nature of personal prophecy. Personal prophecy is always partial. Okay, I want you to make sure that you understand this. Can you give me a, a, a tissue? Personal prophecy is always partial. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 9. Oh, thank you so much. 1 Corinthians 13, 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. You've got to understand that you've got to accept that. You don't have to know everything. When you feel it, shoot you up some things. <laughs> Just hold on to that. I'll probably need it another time sometime in the future. <laughs> Be okay with getting a part of something. But that's the beautiful nature of God's interconnectedness and team ministry. I still tell Sandy, I love ministering with her. It's so much fun. Because I don't have to carry all that. I just get to give my part and enjoy it. And then listen to her part and think, oh, that just is so good. You know, and enjoy and celebrate the team aspect because that's that's just when we get to see God gives this part and this part. You go, wow, that part delivered through that unique person carried more weight than if it had been delivered through my personality. Because God uses our personalities. I'll do a teaching sometime in the future that talks about, you know, that scripture is the vision of soul and spirit. And we kind of draw that line between those two. Melinda's going to know what I'm talking about. What if you flip that line and you drew it this way? You see, we've been taught many times that this is all bad. It's not bad. The nature of sin, that was bad. But my personality is not bad. Your personality is not bad, especially when it's renewed in Christ. So when we can understand, oh, I just got to get myself out of the way. No! God's trying to get you in line and make you a whole person. It is literally schizophrenic to try to divide us from us. Think about it. Just think about it. Sometimes we just hear something and we take it and we live it, and it makes no sense. Think about it. Was Jesus' flesh bad? Yep. Neither is yours, as it is being redeemed. I'm just throwing that out there, because I'm wanting you to get the point that in prophetic ministry, you are the one that hears from the Lord. Not this part of you, this part of you, and this part of you. And you've got to shut this part down in order to hear from this part. God speaks to us. Us. One unit that's come into agreement alignment with heaven. So don't try to distinguish your personality because He's delivering a word through you and He's choosing you to release it because of you. Does that make sense? It's not like I've got to just go crucify my flesh. If you're having a problem with fleshly desires, that's different. Carnality, that's different. But when you are redeemed and your mind is being renewed, you're unified as a person. That's why God will, that's why He talks about delivering in gentleness 
Because it's a part of who you are. Because that's part of your personality as it lines up with heaven. So we know in part, we prophesy in part, but our personality and uniqueness is a part of that. Don't try to hide who you are and deliver it like someone else. Okay? Andrea's delivered stuff that I it just wouldn't have flown well through me. I mean, it just would not have done that. It's because she is a unique person. That's why God gives her that part and gives me a different part. So Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret thing belongs to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us. I want you to think about that. The secret thing belongs to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us. That means every prophetic word that He releases from heaven, it is a gift, and now it is ours. That means we carry the responsibility for developing it. You are a gift to this earth and the people around you. God revealed you to the earth. You were secret, now you're revealed. You're a public. You are a display of His goodness. And you have to begin to understand that, especially in the prophetic, because He's going to use you and release things through you that was very unique. 2 Kings 4.27, Shumite woman. When she came to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. Gehazi, Gehazi came near to push her away, but the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is troubled within her, and the Lord has hidden it from me and not told me. Okay, this is for a prophet. And it was not revealed to him. You cannot put judgment upon yourself because someone stood in front of you and you did not see something. Sometimes we stand and we minister to someone and we're thinking one way and something is completely different. We go, I just didn't see it. And then we start to carry this self-imposed judgment that I wasn't sensitive enough to God. And you can't do that. See, all of those, I'm just kind of pulling out little, little things that plug up the flow of the prophetic in our life. And these self-imposed things, many times, is what plugs it up. Because we put ourselves in a place of condemnation that I just didn't get, I just, I just didn't see it. You know, we prophesy to someone and they're just, we don't know them and they're in a complete lifestyle of rebellion and sin. We're saying, the Father's loved you and He's so pleased with you and He's going to do this and He's got this call on your life. And then somebody else goes, you have no idea. And it's okay to go, no, I don't. God hid that part from me, but what He did give me was His invitation in that person's life to step into a whole new destiny. Amen. Yes, amen. You see, many times the prophetic is just the opposite of what's manifesting in the person's life at that moment. Because it's an invitation in the morning. So you have to be okay with understanding that personal prophecy is partial. Examples. A messianic prophecy. David prophesied an eternal heir to the throne. Isaiah 